I had never done anything like this before. Not even close. I had my troubles as a younger man, but that was a long time ago. Some, if not most of those troubles were certainly against the law, but this was not like that. This was something different. Something I'd never felt before. Something new. While not exactly a happy day, I welcomed the change. Although, change, falls painfully short of doing the situation any real justice. I think, destroy, sums it up a little better. Because that is exactly what I've done, destroyed. Destroyed everything. And yet, all it really took was a quick message to my brain to make my right hand lash out twelve inches and change everything. Twenty years of marriage, twenty years of work, twenty years of cold hard time, all voided like a bad check with one motion. Two if you count my fingers closing around the knife. And with those simple movements, I didn't just stab that fucking weasel, Devin. I stabbed my wife, my career, my parents, my children, even my next-door neighbor who depends on me to keep his lawn and garden in order ever since his elderly body stopped letting him do it himself. I may have even stabbed myself. But it didn't feel that way, at least not just then. In that moment, it felt to me as if the only thing I had destroyed was the cage I had been in for years. Years enough to forget there was a cage at all. I know the worst is surely yet to come, but not yet. For now, everything is okay. For me anyway. I was happy. I had a wife that outdid me heavily in the looks department, children that knew without the slightest doubt that I was, in fact, an actual superhero. I was the only adult of the whole network of parents that could keep up with the kids when they got fully up to speed. And that was something I didn't mind a bit. Running around with kids ranging from age 4 to 8 is plenty exhausting, but pales heavily in comparison to the sickening bouts of small talk I would endure with the adults. For the people that had to put on a mask every morning for work, the weekend felt the best without ever mentioning the weather or sports, or the evils of immigration, etc. Not a single man, woman or child is pleasant and concerned about their neighbor all the time and spending the day getting shit on by emotionally distraught clients and passive-aggressive co-workers is plenty for yours truly to be just about done running the race for any given day. Children never talked about the weather unless it was ruining their outdoor fun at that very second and even then, without parental interference, they would keep playing like the sun was high in the sky and singing John Lennon lyrics. Getting roped into the occasional, casual, conversation means finding, extracting, Dusting off and putting on my mask in the few seconds it takes for someone to meet my eye and make their inevitable approach. Unless, of course, I have an appointment, time to prepare my pleasant ruse of humanity. That's when I drive the point home. The point being, I am just a normal person with normal person problems. I've always spent a large percentage of my time trying to remain invisible via rigid conformity and the path of the absolute least resistance. That means vague opinions and agreements, properly placed head nods and disbelieving guffaws when any given good buddy story happens to have a surprise ending or particularly heinous injustice like getting caught in traffic or held up on the runway before a flight to Cabo. I can understand where anyone is coming from an offer, simulated, empathy for their misfortune or justification for their wrongdoings. As long as each smile or pat on the back brings the exit door a few inches closer, I can be, seem, very charming. Devin fucking Ambrose, the shit-headed and charming catalyst for my tale of vengeance and growth. Even now, as I drive aimlessly, contemplating my next move, I can smell his blood drying on my shirt, and it pulls me out of my satisfied euphoria, reminding me of the daunting choice ahead of me, deciding whether to drive my car off the nearest bridge or donning my old mask and trying to make things right. However the fuck one does that in a situation like this. Oh Devin, how he will be missed. The employee of the month wall will be lonely for a while, sure. But sooner or later, it will find another host and our dear departed Devin will live on through the modest memorial plaque that will no doubt hang on the gray walls of the life insurance firm that employed Devin and myself, providing a nice dose of irony for all who pass by. If I am truly being honest with myself, 
and in humble Devon's defense, the poor bastard was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like some unlucky pedestrian that happened to be incinerated by a time bomb for no other reason than it being placed outside the door of their favorite coffee shop. He was a true blue, passive-aggressive, prick, don't get me wrong. But that doesn't make him much different than most co-workers in such a humanitarian line of work, certainly not enough so that he deserved to be the sole casualty in my mental explosion. Thinking back to those few hours ago, it's now crystal clear to me that it could just as easily have been Margie in reception or Jim from HR. Devin just happened to be the one that made an innocent comment about my showing up to the break room at 8.04 a.m. instead of at the scheduled time of 8 a.m. sharp. And he happened to make that fateful comment the very moment I brandished the butter knife that I planned to use to butter some toast as a late breakfast. It seemed whoever was working the controls in my head this morning decided that plan needed changing once Devin opened his coffee-tainted mouth and instead planted the dull little knife in his eye socket. It was when I pulled the knife out, splattering myself in the eye core of his popped eyeball and what was probably bloody bits of gray brain matter, I'm no expert, that a scream rang out from the doorway of the break room, instinctively causing me to drop the knife onto the table behind me in the break room. Cindy, a fellow insurance agent who just happened to have lunch with our newly, dearly departed on most days and occupied the cubicle directly next to his was passing the break room at the same moment his leaking body collapsed to the floor. She looked at me, my face splattered with gore and trying to think of something to say to justify the grisly scene. I could see in her eyes that she either didn't recognize me after ten years of working together, either that or she couldn't quite accept what she was seeing, the most pleasant and content of her co-workers standing over the twitching, laid-out body of someone she was quite fond of. Before recognition twinkled in her eyes, some primal part of her instinctively made her pick up the bloodied knife from the table where it fell before starting into the room to offer aid to her fallen friend. I put my hands out in front of me in a universal sign of surrender and started to reason with her, I stammered out something that boiled down to, C.I.N., this isn't what it looks like. But luckily for both of us, she appeared to have changed her mind after she got a closer look at how dead her lunch buddy really was, and ran out of the room. I thought about chasing her down, convincing her to keep quiet, but quickly decided it wouldn't make a bit of difference, and ran to my car as fast as my legs would take me. So here I am driving around town and waving at passersby, smiling and going back and forth in my mind between terror and relief like a schizo with nothing more than a Tenryo's grasp on reality. I haven't fully taken suicide by fatal car accident off the table, but I don't think that's where this train is headed. After giving it some very scattered, almost incoherent thought, a new option has presented itself to me. I could go to the nearest gun shop, by the highest powered firearm they have on the shelf before the manhunt in my honor begins, ride the momentum I have stored up after this first gig and take this show on the road. It is an appealing option. And then my mind succumbs to the topsy-turvy circus tent that is my brain and starts pondering on the lack of remorse I feel for slaying young Devon, for taking every single day that would have made up the long remaining years of his life and snuffing it out like a match that has outburned its usefulness. For now, I contributed to the shock of having murdered someone for the first time, slightly expecting, and slighter still hoping that a wave of guilt will wash over me. But I'm not quite sure that wave is going to break. Not for me anyways. Even thinking of this murder as my first time suggests to me that on some level, somewhere deep down in the place that hides trauma and life-ruining memories, I plan on doing it again. A convoy of emergency vehicles speeds past me in the opposite lane, giving me a jolt of solid, tangible reality to bring my mind back to my body. This is happening. This is real. And if I don't make a choice now, one's going to be made for me. Sirens have such a gift for making people shit their pants with fresh, visceral fear, don't they? Or is that just specific to people who still have someone else's blood drying on their clothes? I guess now probably isn't the time for curiosity. 
My cell phone's ringtone suddenly cuts through my focus before my mind could go off on a full-blown deflection mission and I snap out of my daze, grabbing it instantly. I look down to the screen as I drive, what can I say I'm feeling dangerous today, and see that it's Ronnie, my, and Devin's supervisor on the call floor. It's clear that this relaxing drive through town has been made up of a series of procrastinations, keeping me from making the choices that might very well have a direct influence on whether or not I'll be ending this beautiful morning behind bars or worse. What can I say? It's been a doozy of a morning. But now it's time to make a choice. I answer the phone. Hello, I say with as little emotion as I could muster. Jonah, I don't know if you're running late or sick or what have you but it's not like you to miss work without a call or even so little as a text. The confusion that wrapped me up like a hungry boa constrictor after hearing the start of the phone call may as well be sewing my lips together so, naturally, I stay silent. But if you were planning on coming in, don't. I'm sorry to have to tell you this over the phone but there's been quite a tragedy here. His voice wavers and catches in his throat with an audible click. It's a real nightmare, man. With some microscopic piece of realization forming, I managed to say in as believable a voice as possible. Oh no, Ronnie. What happened? It's Devin, Jonah. He's dead. And... And so is Cindy. A rose of warmth and relief blooms in my stomach and I feel as though another piece of the puzzle has fallen into place. It gives me a burst of confidence that seems to make my mask of humanity flare back up and I say, Oh Jesus! Oh my God, Ronnie, no! What happened? I even managed to get my voice to break a little and added a little moisture to the words as if my sinuses had filled up with the urge to weep for my fallen friends. In the voice of a man that has already worked an eight-hour shift in the first sixty minutes of the day, he says, The police have only just started to investigate, but they're saying it looks like Cindy killed Devin and immediately ran out of the building, distraught over what she'd done. She sure must have been because she ran right out into the parking lot and into the path of the number 16 bus that runs through the city. They found a butter knife in her pocket that police say was most likely what killed Devin. Tingling with excitement now, I pull the car off the street and park in a patch of grass near the road, hazard lights flashing for safety. How is that possible, Ronnie? They were best friends. Hell, we all thought they were more than just friends, didn't we? I say, further cementing in his mind my shock and surprise at this ghastly tragedy. The police are saying that most likely had something to do with it. Maybe there had been some trouble in paradise, and things had gotten out of hand. A crime of passion, they're saying. And it certainly was. I don't know, Jonah. It's just after 9 a.m., and I'm already exhausted. Anyways, we're closed up for the day on account of the entire police force stomping through the building. Then he adds as an afterthought. And out of respect, I suppose. Of course, boss. You hang in there. I'm really sorry you had to go through all that. I say, which absolutely sounds like a bit much even to me but adrenaline is seeping into my words so I hang up the phone before he has a chance to offer me the same empty condolence that I gave him. I'm almost ashamed to admit this last part, but my first thought upon hanging up the phone was one of relief at the fact that, not only would I most likely end the day as a man both free and breathing, I'd also get paid for it. As far as first impressions go, I must say this one wasn't so bad. With my wife never even finding out, my work washing their smug hands of it, and the police pinning the crime on a woman that did me an enormous favor by panicking her way into becoming a speed bump, it turns out dearly departed Devon was the only person I killed, so to speak. Well, one could certainly argue that I might be to blame for Cindy's death as well. If one knew, that is. I've never been anything resembling a religious man. But if there is some force out in the universe, policing human morality, balancing the cosmic scales with green checks for good deeds and scary red excess for the bad ones, saving the damsel in distress at the very second before a train cuts her in three, they sure didn't try too hard to stop me. I wonder who will be the employee of the month now. I buried my dog last month, I think. 
There was so little left of him, and his once golden rich coat was so faded and sallow that this empty, sickly canine corpse hardly seemed to be the same cheerful, energetic good boy who had run after the neighborhood cars so quickly, who retrieved that red squishy ball so playfully, and who had served so loyally as a companion in the park when I needed to display his inherent cuteness to act as my chick magnet. Loki, I called him, simply because his pointy little ears evoked the classic helmet of the Marvel incarnation, and he always seemed to have a knowing grin fitting of the god of mischief. It was not a name selected, I must emphasize, with any idea of the hell his death would send me to or that from his depth I would be tormented by my own personal Jormungan. I awoke that morning with an odd, undefined sense of dread. It was the sound of silence that stirred me out of grey, troubling dreams. There was none of Loki's jubilant, early morning barking, nor his hungry scratching at my door, and the pitter-patter of his padded paws could not be heard. I sensed intuitively that something was wrong. There was a draft in the house, and I came down to find the front door open. I cursed in incredulity. I always locked up. But somehow the door was open and the dog got out. Imagine my shock when I stepped onto the front lawn looking for my missing dog, and found that emaciated, discolored corpse waiting for me. My throat sunk into my intestines as I looked at that dead lump of sickly flesh that had once been my best friend. I turned pale in shock. My skin felt tight and cold, and my jaw gaped open. I didn't even notice I was standing barefoot in his last shit. I was not only shocked, but puzzled as well. The boy hadn't been sick. There was no visible injury. How had it happened? What killed him? My cousin Ivor is a veterinarian. I was saddened by my dog's death and perturbed by the mystery of it. A rational mind might tell me there was nothing supernatural or uncannily strange about it. An undetected brain tumor or maybe he ate something he shouldn't have. Ivor empathized and offered an autopsy to assuage my curiosity, if nothing else. Using a shovel, albeit gently, to pick up my friend and put him in a black garbage bag, felt so inglorious and disrespectful. Driving to my cousin's clinic, I felt that no explanation would be sufficient, no combination of words and condolences would replace the gap in my life and the hole in my heart. The autopsy took a couple of hours. Ivor told me the results would take a few weeks and looked perturbed by what he had seen already. I didn't ask him any questions and he handed me my best friend in a small, unmarked box. I buried him in the backyard and resigned myself to a life without Loki. People grieve differently and I suppose, we react differently to different kinds of deaths. When my mother killed herself, I lost all appetite and the food I forced down my throat tasted of ashes. Yet in the days and weeks following Loki's passing, I found I was struck by a strange, insatiable hunger. I naturally assumed this was a coping mechanism, and wondered if I would return to normal, if I ever was, when I got the results of the autopsy. Closure is such an odd, human concept and I wonder if any of us ever truly find it. Not in this life. The strange thing was, as much as I ate, I couldn't seem to fully fill my belly, and I hungered still. My friends were shocked and concerned by my weight loss. They knew about my dog and would also assume I was growing thin out of grief. I didn't puzzle their minds and perturb them by my strange, nightmarish fancy that it wasn't just my mouth that demanded sustenance. That I had a thousand appetites within me all calling out for more, more, more. Something that could never be satisfied or even questioned. I started to eat things I never had before. I always found escargot disgusting, but now I was scarfing down plate after plate of snails, craving them in the middle of the night. Part of me even wanted to try them raw. I couldn't even taste the slimy squishiness. There was no pleasure in eating anymore. I just knew I had to have it. I actually lost weight. I spent my days inside with the curtains closed. I avoided the sun and often let the phone ring and ring until my friends left messages I deleted without listening. Sleep was slow in coming and filled with unsettling dreams I forgot by the time I fully regained consciousness. 
Sometimes I was awakened by nothing less than the rumbling of my own empty stomach, demanding that I go to the kitchen for a bowl of cottage cheese, weak old pizza from the freezer, that bruised apple that looked a day from spoiling. Or yes, more of those awful snails. It didn't matter. Nothing tasted like anything and nothing could fulfill me. My bowel movements were prolonged and painful. I would instantly flush, because I didn't want to know if there was blood in my stool. My skin was pale and pasty. There were black rings under my eyes and I didn't recognize the face in the mirror looking back. I think I was falling apart. I didn't want to go to a doctor. Nothing they could tell me would be any comfort, and there was no cure for whatever this was. There was something new in me, but what I initially thought of as a gape in my life didn't feel accurate. It had been filled, unmistakably, with something. The thought, a question as unanswerable as the hunger, kept me up at night. Had I caught it from Loki? Was it death? Was it something worse? In this life, there are questions we don't really want answered. I got mine last night, and I don't know if I will ever sleep again. I woke in pain, a terrible pain I had never felt before and could not define. I sat up and found blood on the sheets. A dripping red stain, but no wound. To my horror, I realized it was coming out of the back of me. I gasped for air as the foulness of the situation I still didn't understand, not at all, washed over me. There was so much blood, I felt weak and drained. I don't know if I had anything left in me for tears, so I just howled for how unfair, how painful, how senseless it all was. My dry, self-pitting sobs were broken only by the ringing of my phone by my bedside. It was Ivor, of course, pretty much the only number I would answer these days. He normally wouldn't call at such a godless hour, but he knew I was suffering, just waiting for an answer. If he knew that I was not only waiting to hear the results of my dog's autopsy but afflicted with something indescribable myself, he would have spoken with more alarm and caution. If I knew what he had to tell me, I would not have picked up the phone. I know it's late, my cousin said tiredly, but I got the results. He paused with anticipation. Would you prefer I call back tomorrow and talk about it then? No, I snapped quickly perhaps louder than I should. I took a breath and tried to calm. I'm sorry, i just like to know now. Please. Yeah, he responded agreeably. He had no idea what I had been going through. He hadn't seen me since the day I dropped off my dog. It turns out Loki had parasites. P-parasites? I swallowed as that ugly word rolled over my tongue and let it settle. You taken any trips to Indonesia recently? He asked with a more than intellectual curiosity. Indonesia? The question baffled and annoyed me. What was he on about? Tinia Padoha, he announced. Indonesian tapeworm. I knew it was worms, but I had to send away to find out this deadly variety. Very rare. Almost extinct in the wild. He sounded unsettled. Apparently it's typically found only in the intestines of orangutans. Orangutans? I repeatedly dryly, rubbing the bridge of my nose. Nearly extinct. God knows how it got in your dog. So it's um. I caught my breath as I tried to gather my thoughts. It's bad, right? Haven't been many studies, he admitted. But it does appear to be the kind of thing that drains the host spreads from the intestine to parts unknown, reproduces internally, latches onto the digestive system, growing and growing while the body it's in shrinks and weakens. They even get into the brain, adjust the behavior so that the host eats what they want, stays until there's nothing left but a dry, empty husk. I felt a chill come over me. I could barely ask this next question, but I had to know. H. How? I took moment. How do they spread? You have to eat the host or what? That's one way. Or you could step in the host's feces. That's where they lay their eggs. That was it then. I had forgotten all about that detail, which at the time I thought was just a gross little annoyance of a day of tragedy. 
I was more concerned with laying my dog to rest than washing my feet. Now I knew that one misstep I had blocked out of my memory as soon as I was clean had damned me. I dropped the phone without thanking my cousin or saying goodbye. I was so beyond such niceties now. I didn't even care that my screen cracked on the hard wooden floor. I didn't care about any of that anymore. I wanted to withdraw from this foul world. I wanted to be alone. But I wasn't. No sooner had the phone dropped than I was struck with a sharp, searing pain in my backside. It was like I was being torn apart. My insides were on fire. I ran to the restroom, even though I knew it was futile to try to drain this evil out of me. I sat there for hours, dry sobbing and hoping for some relief that wouldn't come. Then I heard it. A faint sound coming from within myself. It started with a strange hiss, like steam escaping, then it started to talk. He's right, you know, came an uncanny, high-pitched voice I could only describe as inhuman. We are inside you, and we're not going anywhere. We like it in here, crawling around, eating what you eat, draining you from within, making our home here. It's not just your intestines. We're all over. We'll be in your brain soon. You won't be able to think for yourself. You'll just be a vessel. You will waste away while we grow stronger and legion. Then I felt a squiggling come out of me. I jumped up in shock and was more disgusted than I had ever been in my life when I looked in the mirror and saw the king worm, thin and slimy, poking out to taunt me. I will never forget its beady little eyes or sharp fangs as it grinned and told me. So eat hearty, before withdrawing back into my bowels. I don't know how much time I have left. I don't care. My thoughts are getting hazy. All I do now in my last days is eat and eat, feeding those monsters inside me. It won't be long soon. When they crawl into my brain, I hope they make me okay with it. I am their slave, but maybe my horror will fade into complacency as I am eaten alive from within. They will leave me an empty shell like the last time I saw my dog, if it was even him anymore. Until then, I am in hell where the worm does not die. Subscribe and make sure to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories, linked at the top of the description. Either way, thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you guys next time.